So, Professor Vasudevan, uh, uh, thank you very much uh, today uh, having us uh, as your visitors. And um, first of all, uh, let me start by um, the congratulating you uh, on becoming the um, new member of the Hall of Fame uh, Kyoto. Thank congratulations. Well, uh, thank you very much. I'm absolutely delighted and honored by the by this award, and I hope I will uh, not disappoint you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, then uh, let me uh, um, begin with uh, this uh, question. Um, what strikes me uh, from your uh, huge uh, accomplishment and achievements uh, in your uh, academic writings and lectures and the lecture today um, is that the strong combination um, between the um, poverty study and uh, environmental uh, economics or the uh, environment uh, related studies more broadly. Uh, I mean that uh, such combination uh, is essential uh, when we address the severe real issues uh, in terms of the poverty uh, in each society and in the international community uh, more broadly. So uh, what um, brings you to uh, such combination, I mean, the how have you uh, developed uh, your uh, strong interest uh, in the uh, poverty issues on the one hand, while uh, keeping the um, analytical way of thinking uh, okay. in the uh, economics? So, uh, would you explain? I'm an economic theorist and I have a very strong um, attraction towards analytical rigor and consistency. And I've never liked the idea that when you study poverty, you ignore the rest of economics and the rest of economics uh, ignores poverty. It should be integrated within it. I realized pretty early on, and I suspect it has something to do with the fact that I come from India and I was raised in India. And uh, the university campus where I, I was raised, my, my father was a professor, uh, was very near and cultural fields and you could see real poverty amongst the uh, poor laborers. Uh, I'm talking now about the 19, late 40s, 1940s, when I was five and six years of age. I could see in the cold winter um, women drawing water from the from the well, you know, using very primitive technology uh, with no shoes, no it's a cold water pouring over. Images have lived, been with me. And I've always thought in terms of poverty in the rural context. And the other thing I realized, that although I didn't use that language, today I would use it, that the human body is an ecosystem, ecological system. And how does the, this system re respond to stresses? Mm. So I became very interested in nutrition. Mm. I really, in the late 80s, early 90s, I studied nutrition science very, very deeply. And my book, An Inquiry into Wellbeing and Destitution, Remember the word is destitution, mm -hmm. not poverty, destitution, which one, somebody who doesn't have any assets. Okay. Um, I realized that oh, I need to understand how the body copes with stresses in lack of protein, let's say. So I studied that very carefully mm -hmm. and I built up a model of uh, uh, human imbalance. I tried to understand uh, endemic unemployment in India, for example, through this process, through this. It required some not interesting mathematics, by the way. Um, so I did that, and that was in a series of papers I produced with a colleague, a young colleague of mine at that time at Stanford, Devraj Ray, who is now a very distinguished 
economist at New York University. And I produced those papers and then the, with, with him. And uh, he, he and I produced about four papers on this field of trying to understand unemployment, malnourishment through this integrating the human body in a market economy as to why the market cannot necessarily solve the problem of adequate nutrition. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, I had to explain why this problem doesn't occur in, say, Japan anymore, or UK, or America. Okay. So the theory has to also show how you can move away from that trap, this poverty trap, which is affecting your body functions, mm -hmm. to one in which you can escape from it. So we did that, Ray and I did that as well. And we put this, I put this together into a book called The Inquiry into Wellbeing and Destitution in 1993. It's one of my favorite books, um, but it did not have any impact on poverty studies amongst economists. For some reason, it just fell flat. Um, I tried to understand, uh, embed the poor household in the local ecology and the the, the start understanding of poverty in that book is relates to the local environment as well, but it fell flat. It has not affected the studies of poverty at all. The people who have taken my work seriously, roughly, were anthropologists. Um, most economics departments, major departments of economics, don't have any ecological economics in it. None. Mine doesn't in Cambridge. doesn't have none of them. Harvard doesn't. Uh, as far as I know, MIT doesn't, Stanford doesn't. Okay, <laughs> this is very strange. It's really strange. They'll be interested because there are there there, there are dynamic social dynamics at work here, which uh, which keeps the economics department in some ways isolated, insulated mm -hmm. from ecological concerns. I think ever since the Enlightenment, at least at least from the Enlightenment, you know. 16th century, 17th century, 17th century, 18th century period in, in the UK, in Europe. We've been very, uh, the intellectual thinking has been focused on the human person. Mm -hmm. It's we are the important ones. And, and it's, at least initially, the Renaissance onwards, mm -hmm. it was admiring ourselves. Mm -hmm. We are smart, we are beautiful, we are powerful, we create things, art, music, science, literature, and we are very inward looking. We look at ourselves and nature is out. Mm -hmm. So let me say, I'm talking about me. Mm -hmm. I'm the human person. What do I include in it? Well, of course, I include my body, my arms, legs. Mm -hmm. What about the bacteria in my stomach, without which I would mm -hmm. not be able to digest food? Well, then it's something to say, no, they are part of you. Because without them, I'm dead. Mm -hmm. So my human person, as a person, includes a good deal of ecological material. Mm -hmm. So um, let me move to my second question. So I, I, I think that um, part of uh, your answer to this question uh, was uh, already talked uh, in your um, talk uh, so far, uh, but uh, I'm uh, still curious about uh, what is uh, your observation about the uh, future of the economist um, in terms of the possible collaboration uh, with the uh, ecologist or uh, any other um, researchers in disciplines. Uh, I think the, uh, it's the uh, long standing and still going on the huge challenge uh, for us to uh, promote the uh, multidisciplinary study. I mean, the, in the contemporary world, we have many, many real world challenges that require the uh, multidisciplinary uh, addressing. But nonetheless, the, uh, I personally feel that then uh, uh, many of us, uh, uh, except you, <laughs> but many of uh, contemporary uh, researchers have been uh, still struggling 
the, uh, with the question of uh, how to develop the uh, multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary research. Mm. Uh, we forget very often how the, the deep interaction between academic economics and policy making. And therefore, because the policy makers were academic students of the academic mm. economics, and this perpetuation influences the citizens' perception of what an economic problem is, how to think about the future. So we are in a very dangerous world. We like to think. It's not a question of, you know, I like ecological economics, so I like it to be studied. It's damned important. That's why it should be studied. Oh, well, uh, let me add uh, one small comment uh, mm. before we move to the, uh, my next question. Yes. Sir. I mean, the, um, in the Japan, uh, Japanese uh, academia, uh, I think I have observed the uh, strong segmentation of um, uh, disciplines uh, in academia. For example, uh, several decades ago, a great political philosopher, um, Maso Mariyama, mm -hmm. um, mentioned the uh, term of the octopus pot. Yeah. And uh, he, he used this, this term uh, when he, he uh, commented on the um, realities uh, of academia several decades ago. But nonetheless, uh, we Japanese researchers uh, have been still struggling with such the same reality. So th that's my uh, own uh, strong um, interest. Uh, in how to uh, overcome, not overcome maybe, but uh, address uh, the such strong segment, uh, segmentation. segmentation. Yes. Absolutely yeah. right. Okay, so uh, let me move to uh, this, um, another group of questions. I mean, the uh, Japanese high school students uh, have learned uh, about uh, your uh, achievements. And they come up, uh, came across uh, your concepts and ideas, uh, such as the um, inclusive index of wealth, uh, or the uh, link uh, between the um, ecology, biodiversity, and economics. And they were so inspired. And I think I know that because, uh, uh, partly because uh, I served as the instructor uh, for them. And uh, actually we had uh, the, some uh, opportunities of uh, the studying for them. And uh, they were so uh, inspired uh, by your works. And I believe uh, they will be e inspired by your uh, lecture uh, when it's um, released. And uh, at the same time, they e have many, many questions. And so uh, allow me to uh, select uh, only e three uh, of them. And uh, first question uh, is this. What implication would a combination of economics and ecology uh, have on the existing common conception of the natural environment? I mean, the, uh, all they know now uh, is the uh, common sense understanding of the natural environment in Japanese uh, society. So they uh, are wondering um, what uh, the combination of ecology and economics um, strongly proposed by you uh, would have impact on such a uh, common sense um, or the, um, the mature understanding of the environment, uh, ever, uh, in natural environment. Thank so you please. very much. That's very, it's a very reasonable question to ask and a very hard one to answer, but I'll try. Um, I think in, it's useful to remember that in, in the West, and I include Japan as in the West in the sense of industrial <laughs> uh, giants, if you like, okay? 
um, in the West. For reasons that in some sense we have covered, people like to think of the environment as a luxury good, mm -hmm. as, a, as, a, as an amenity. Uh, parks, you need parks. Why? Because you like to have a nice walk in the evening. Uh, uh, state parks, national parks, forests, and so forth. These are amenities in some sense. And I think much of environmental economics, not ecological economics, but environmental economics of the 1970s, 80s, 90s, even, even now, focuses on the amenity value of nature. Oh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's important because it, it's, you know, our, our spiritual needs are also, it's not, it's not just pleasure, but our spiritual needs are satisfied. What I think I've tried to emphasize in my own work as and learning from the ecologist is to see nature also, also as a productive asset, not just as an immunity. Mm -hmm. Without her, she, we can't do things. Uh, we use her services and goods to produce things. So she's an asset like a table, chair. She's also an asset mm -hmm. as, a product, as a means of production. Mm -hmm. To, for, for commodity, not just an immediate. Um, and I think a good deal of the focus should now shift to the immediate, uh, to the productivity value, mm -hmm. which students in rich countries may forget. One reason they forget, and I think there is a deep reason for it. You see, much of the, our need for biodiversity, for example, or primary products, mm. the raw material which we use to produce goods and services and GDP, are taken from poor countries, other countries. Mm. See, for example, UK doesn't have much biodiversity left. Mm. So it depends on the biodiversity of other countries, mm. poor countries, Africa, mm. Asia, mm. and so forth, to, to produce the primary products which can be used, mm. um, pharmaceuticals, you, you name it, many, many other things, uh, uh, fibers and so forth. Now, if that happens elsewhere, you think of the experience, colonial experience, experience of the Industrial Revolution onwards, if you, you're importing primary products from outside and then transforming them with human labor and so forth into railroads and factories and produce goods and which you then export to other countries, then the resource constraints appear less because if primary product from one source dries up, mm. you go to another source mm. and then you go to another source. Mm. So in a way, it's, you, don't have to, you don't think that much about the fact that they may be running out of primary products. By primary products, I mean timber, I mean, oh, you know, minerals, metals, and so forth. So you, you, you can go from one source to another, and for your purposes. So in a way, it becomes detached from your own needs. The only area where I think, for example, a student in Japan would be concerned about the productivity of nature would be over fisheries, for example. Mm -hmm coastal fisheries, because those are, if the fisheries are damaged, price of fish rises, and that affects. And of course, there'll be other things, but again, it's all probably through amenities, mm. uh, you know, parks, forests, forests, and so forth. So in a way, it's a problematic question here. Students in the first world of, th of the West, industrial West, need to be aware that nature is the source of not our values, but our production structure. Mm. And we may not be aware of it because we're importing it from another country. But eventually there has to be a balance between demand and supply. Mm. And then we come back to the question that we were discussing before. So I, I would think that's one of the things that um, tr international trade can make us forget the source of our livelihoods. If I need something and I can get it by importing it from another country, I don't necessarily ask, can that country supply me with this forever or 
will they be running out of it? If you see what I mean. Mm -hmm. So I think the separation from the act of consumption, from the act, from the source, that separation can create problems in our understanding of the of the economic world. And since so much of our primary products comes from other countries, the tropics, this delinking of what we consume and where it's produced can create problems and is creating problems in my judgment. When we talk about the uh, international supply and the demand, uh, the t traditionally uh, people talk, have talked about the raw materials, mm -hmm. but uh, more recently, uh, for example, the, um, uh, today an um, uh, increasing number of people have talked about the virtual water. But uh, in your uh, answer to this question, uh, you mentioned uh, such international supply and demand uh, in terms of biodiversity, uh, which is very, very striking to me. Right. Yeah. Thank you very much. So uh, allow me uh, move to uh, move to the uh, next question. The uh, second question uh, from the Japanese high school students uh, is this. What action do governments and citizens in the global north need, um, need to take uh, in order to uh, address extreme and uh, ex uh, extensive poverty in the global south? So let me uh, paraphrase this question. So uh, in your lecture and your uh, many, many publications, uh, you have worked on the uh, poverty issues uh, in uh, economically um, uh, uh, rigorously economic uh, way of thinking. And uh, uh, so uh, Japanese students uh, were very uh, impressed uh, such as <coughs> the combination uh, between the two perspectives. But uh, at the same time, uh, they, I, young people, so they tend to uh, look at the future. So what can we do uh, in order to address uh, this uh, important challenge? So uh, would you... Sure, of that? course, absolutely right. It's a darn good question. I can give an answer in a, at least as I see it, which is we don't pay for what we consume mm -hmm. fully. Um, one of the things about nature is that so much of natural nature services are unpriced for a variety of reasons, which I've written a lot about and which are quite obvious. This has to do with externalities. I'm, let's say I take a primary product imported from a, 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 a farmer uh, in a country. And when I do that, the production of the far farmer's production hurts the has some negative effect on mm -hmm. a neighboring farm, mm -hmm. pollination or whatever. But that harm is not included in the price mm -hmm. of the product. Mm -hmm. So when I import, the price that I pay is less than what I should. Mm -hmm. Not because I'm cheating anybody, <laughs> but I'm not being asked to, because there is a lack of property rights yes. at the source. And so I'm consuming more than I should. I'm demanding more than I should mm -hmm. because the price is too low. Mm -hmm. And it's, if you look at it that way, I think you can get a long, a long way as to what the global north, if you like, can do to the global south, which it should pay more for imports, more mm -hmm. primary products. Mm -hmm. um, now, there are many, many problems here. The problems are the governments in poorer countries. They are damn keen on getting some export revenue. They're not particularly worried as to whether mm. they're losing 20% of the export proceedings because they're not facing it. It's some other poor chap, mm. another farmer who is facing it in their, their own country. Um, so there is a kind of an implicit conspiracy between rulers in primary product exporting countries who are not rich and they need uh, and the importers, mm -hmm. that in a way we are, un we are underpaying for the primary products because the ecological damages that are taking place in the global south are not being included in the prices that the mm -hmm. global north, let's say, 
um, imports um, uh, for, the, for, the, for the goods that are being imported. Which another way of looking at it is, is to say that international trade of this kind from the global south to the global north involves a wealth redistribution from the poor to the rich. Mm. Because if the poor country is underpricing its export, mm. it means that they're, lo- they're transferring some wealth, right? So it's a very odd thing when the um, international um, GATS, you know, the trade organization, not used to be GAP, you know, the international trade organization. I, yeah, yeah, I think it's called the World Trade Organization, mm-hmm. WTO. Yeah. They want expansion of trade, mm-hmm. but they don't have it in their mind to recognize that trade involves externalities, and, therefore, mm-hmm. and these externalities can be detrimental to the exporter of primary products. Mm-hmm. Therefore, instead of simply saying expand trade, export more. The World Bank tells the countries, export more, you need revenue, otherwise you go broke, you can't give your investment. That's all mining nature again. Mm. It's pouncing on nature. Mm. If they would have it, they would destroy the Amazon in order for Brazil to become rich. Mm. But you can see this is a terrible problem. There's a problem of underpricing of exports of primary products. I'm talking about primary products now. And uh, that means there is well distribution from the poor to the rich, poor countries to the rich, which the WTO does not understand or recognize. So we have a problem here. And I think to the answer to the student's question would be that you perhaps you want to insist on your governments to start paying more for these products, have agreements with these countries, exporting countries. Uh, and the exporting countries themselves should cooperate to have export taxes our primary products, to be able to include the damage that exporting is causing their natural, their own natural environment. These are externalities, you see. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I think that's a big thing for trade theorists and trade practitioners to think about. They have not thought about it. Because the language in which the WTO operates does not include it. They will, of course, say, yes, the environment must be protected. <laughs> but that doesn't mean anything. That doesn't mean anything. It's like saying we ought to increase GDP growth. Mm-hmm. And of course, the environment has to be protected. But GDP growth, it, it may be at loggerheads with environment protection because GDP is gross domestic product. Mm-hmm. doesn't take mm-hmm. into. So you've got a real serious language problem arising out of neglect of nature in economics. So our entire grammar of economic thinking can mislead us. Mm. And I feel that uh, when we look at the, uh, the current reality of the WTO and some other international uh, economic organizations, uh, we can uh, see a link between such reality uh, and uh, the point you made earlier. I mean, the, uh, you talked about the um, economic, uh, the mainstream economic way of thinking, uh, that has excluded the, um, the natural environment as the uh, essential uh, entity and, uh, WTO and some other, uh, international organizations have been dominated by the economists. So, so these two uh, points are closely related. I, th- that's my, uh, feeling. Yes, absolutely. And, uh, you know, this is, this is a very serious problem. Uh, the World Bank is a very good example of a major institution, and they have, in a sense, defined the field of development economics in mm-hmm. some sense. Uh, of, of, you know, they have huge resources, and development economists often consult for the World Bank. Uh, they have relationships. So there is an interesting synergy of economic ideas that come are midwifed by the bank, World Bank, uh, in its conception of economic development. And that's been very dangerous. I think it's been extremely un, 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 uh, unfortunate. Uh, they, of course, they, they'll say, we have an environment department. Mm-hmm. They do. There's a vice presidency of environment. But it's minor. That's a serious work goes on <laughs> elsewhere, you know, in terms of where the aid goes and the, entire, the grammar of economic thinking. Nature becomes an add-on 
It'll be like writing a report on projects and then having an appendix thing. And then there is, of course, the environment. <laughs> a checklist. Okay, that, you know, we don't destroy the, you know, your emissions should not be more than so much and so forth. That's not how you do it. It's only, these are afterthoughts. And you can then easily soften those to do what you really want to do, mm. which is so. Yes, it's 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 um, our our mental picture of economic activity excludes nature, mm. and it's brought in when somebody complains mm. for one problem, and the next problem comes, he doesn't have again. Mm. It's kept out. That's not the way to do it. It's uh, uh, it's. It's very pervasive on neglect of nature. Yeah. Okay, so um, then uh, let me move to the last question from the uh, Japanese high school students, um, which is this. Uh, how can citizens, governments, and other stakeholders establish uh, social institutions based on the, the inclusive uh, wealth index of robust view? So they are very, very impressed uh, and inspired uh, by your proposal, but at the same time, they are um, um, struggling uh, with the question of how to uh, ground uh, this, this such index idea uh, to the uh, real world world. And uh, as I said before, uh, they are still young, so they tend to look at the future. Of course. So right. uh, would you uh, answer this question? Well, it wouldn't be very hard because I'm not a practitioner. I don't know the, I don't have a deep understanding of the mechanism by which influence filters through society. I wrote about inclusive wealth and the reason for it being the right thing for us to look at. In collaboration with my friend Carl Yuran Mailer, we wrote the first paper on this in about 25 years ago now, um, showing why we have to move away from income to wealth as a measure of prospects. Mm. And there is a very important reason, since it's a student's question, I want to give it sort of a hint to the student of how to think about it. When you talk, think about today versus tomorrow, and tomorrow versus day after tomorrow, that link mm -hmm. across time. What you are passing from one period to another is not income, but wealth. It's stocks of capital. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So when a parent dies, what he leaves or she <laughs> leaves behind for the children are assets, mm -hmm. the home, the land, stocks or bonds, those are assets. So shift your attention away from income, which are flows, mm. to stocks. Mm. That's the reason we have to move away from GDP and incomes to wealth, because wealth is the value of stocks. Mm. It's stocks which we pass on from one generation to another, mm. from one time to another. I'm passing stocks from this year to next year. Mm. I dissave in some ways and we accumulate in some other ways and so forth. Okay, so that's the point, first point. Now these stocks must include natural stocks, nature stocks, not just produced capital and human capital, but natural capital as well. That's why inclusive wealth becomes the index and there's a theory there and it's proven. Now, some countries are moving in that direction. And I, I was very careful right from the beginning to say we should not move to inclusive wealth index immediately because it could create confusion and there is a already long-standing national accounts departments, mm -hmm. and then there will be clashes of egos and God knows what else, mm -hmm. have instead a natural capital component to national accounts. Keep it separate even. Mm -hmm. But in other words, try and find out what stocks the country owns. Funnily, 20 years ago, when we were trying to do some empirical work on inclusive wealth, we found many countries didn't have any estimate of the stock of fish, fish stocks. Mm -hmm. they, didn't, they didn't have a map of their country in terms of lakes, forests, forest cover, yes, mm -hmm. because these days you can get that from up, up, up from the atmosphere, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, these uh, cameras yes. floating around. But what's going on inside, they don't know. 
Mm. They don't peer into the forest to get a sense of what are the ecological services, what the products are taking place and so forth. So it's important to have an account of the assets a nation has at its disposal and their national, natural accounts. National accounts should have an account of the assets, natural assets. Uh, and some of them you may not be able to value because there may not be any prices. But you can then certainly say the quality, describe the quality. Say, for example, five years ago, there were more wetlands. Today, so many of the wetlands have been converted into shopping malls. Mm -hmm. So we've gained some shopping malls, produced capital. Mm -hmm. That's in the national accounts. Mm -hmm. But the fact that we have lost the wetland is not in the national accounts. Mm -hmm. So that should be compensated. That should be mentioned. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I've been in urging the young people would be to say that the governments ought to publish natural capital accounts. Not necessarily amalgamated with national G, you know, GDP accounts, mm. but at least certainly separate. Mm. And then if you say that, look, we've grown, GDP has grown 5% each year for the last 10 years, we are, aren't we doing very well, terrific, let's, let's celebrate. Then somebody says, no, yes, but maybe, but at the same time, we have lost 15% mm. of the wetlands, 10% of forest cover, some, and so forth and so on. Mm. That's important. That information should be there. So I think I would say that's the way to proceed. We need to have natural capital accounts, not only at the national level, but at the regional level, at the state level, at the town level. Mm -hmm. Cambridge, if it has ideas of thinking of, you know, how are we doing as a Cambridge share, as a province, as it uh, relative to what we were five years ago, we could see how many, how much green space have we got now as we from before. Uh, the water that comes out of it. This is a very chalky area, by the way. There are chalk streams, mm -hmm. uh, calcium, calcium cup. So what's the quality of the water? How much of the water is being cleaned naturally? Mm -hmm. And how much is required at the top end before people can drink it? These are important pieces of information about the quality of the environment mm -hmm. and they ought to be included. So that would be my advice that Yes, this is not a problem only for the global, at the global level, biodiversity and all that. That's really also at the local level. And that's why I'm much more optimistic about biodiversity protection than I am about climate change. Because climate change, you and I can't do anything about it. We can protest, but we are small. We have nothing... You know, our emission doesn't amount to much. Mm -hmm. We can act as citizens, but as personal life, we can't do very much. On biodiversity, we can, because our neighborhood, if we have an influence on our neighborhood... You can see. We can see. Can, we can yeah, see. Okay. Now, I think um, young students should take interest in their neighborhood. So then, uh, can I e e summarize the uh, point you made uh, in such a way that you uh, stress the importance of the multi-level governance yes. uh, from yeah. the global to the local. Yeah. Yeah. I see. Very much so, absolutely, down the line. Yeah, and then lateral, true. because mm. locals need to cooperate with themselves. Mm. Because spills, what we do here is affecting the locality there through lateral externalities. Mm. And so there needs to be a lot more <laughs> A connection between the localities. Um, and there is some, of course. I mean, if I build a road which is affecting another locality, they're going to complain. Yep. But there needs to be more of a planning about maintaining the fact that um, there need to be corridors, for example, where organisms, animals can travel from mm -hmm. one place to another. If you build a mm. uh, highway, that blocks the corridors, and that's very damaging too. Mm. Uh, one of the things I learned in recent years, very much the work by wonderful ecologists like Tom Lockjoy and others, was fragmentation of ecosystem is extremely dangerous. It's extremely pernicious. Mm. Um, when you fragment a forest, then the total productivity of the parts 
is smaller than the productivity of the whole. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so fragmentation is the way we, we, we sometimes think that it's really destroying a forest, which is bad. Of course it's bad. But fragmenting a forest may not seem as though you're destroying it, but mm -hmm. actually, actually you are. Mm -hmm. And today the Amazon is very fragmented. If you take the, mm -hmm. the pictures of it, you see roads everywhere, the occasional mine, and so forth. And that has really reduced its productivity in terms of air cycling, air mm -hmm. cycling of air flows and uh, rain. Oh. So yes, these are interconnected uh, processes, which we began by, I began by talking about mm -hmm. complementarities um, and fragmentation focuses on these complementarities mm -hmm. and shows how, how we, uh, we deplete nature. Uh, fragmenting doesn't look as though we're depleting nature. Okay, what, what's one road, what's wrong with that? But no, it does, it breaks mm -hmm. down the into two parts. Animals here can't move there, mm -hmm. animals there can't move here, and all sorts of things happen. And I, I speculate the uh, same kind of thing has been going on in the uh, Southeast Asia. Yeah. And maybe in India. Of course. And of course, African countries. Oh, no, no, of course. Many, many of course, parts of the world. Of course. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. These are all the yeah. sins of the West are being visited upon in the, <laughs> in the East now in, in a magnified way <laughs> because we can create. We can fragment more efficiently now. <laughs> We've got machinery which we didn't have 100 years ago. I mean, cutting a forest 100 years ago yeah. would have been much costlier <laughs> than it is today. You can not just trace it. <laughs> okay, so uh, allow me um, to move to the last question. Uh, so uh, I want to uh, ask you to give the um, any message to the uh, Japanese youth or the youth uh, in any other countries. And uh, in this specific um, the event, uh, the high school students are our focus. But uh, more generally, uh, would you uh, give them uh, any message um, the, to youth uh, who, who uh, expect you to live longer away than me. <laughs> so, would you, would you give uh, would you give them uh, any uh, message uh, towards the um, the uh, future possibility um, of the uh, working um, for the sake of the uh, environment or the biodiversity? Um, I would say the thing to think about is. Be very, very suspicious of claims about economic claims made by decision makers, no matter which country it is, whether it's Japan, China, mm -hmm. anything. Be very suspicious. They're not because they are cro crooked or corrupt or anything like that. No, they may be, but that's not the reason. The reason is that the language, the grammar that they're using to justify economic policies is wrong, built on wrong, wrong foundations. Mm -hmm. So, not everything they suggest is bad, but many things they do, uh, they suggest, recommend, and pursue go against protection of a vital factor of production, an asset, namely natural capital, biodiversity, ecosystems in general. And the way to correct for that is to insist that the ecosystems are taken into account in the economic planning or the economic program that is being espoused. I think that's where the young person could be very effective. Mm -hmm. Young people are very effective today. They can really dislodge governments, as we recently saw in Bangladesh. Um, so, and all strength to them. If they feel there's something wrong, they ought to express it. But the one thing that I have not seen them taking serious attention over is ecological problems. And it's important for them, particularly if they worry about poverty because in their own countries, because in the poorer countries, poverty and environmental degradation are linked very strongly in the way we discussed before, mm -hmm. whether it's in, uh, in Africa, Latin America, South Asia, very, very, because the poorest live on natural capital mm -hmm. far more than you and I do. We buy, we live off the natural capital elsewhere, mm -hmm. uh, 
they live on it, their daily lives live on it, uh, depend on it. So if you really are interested in poverty, then you will be an, naturally an environmentalist automatically mm -hmm. because the poorest in the poor countries are based on, built, their lives are built on ecosystems mm -hmm. and the biodiversity. That sort of. So that's, that's the good news. The good news is that the two are not, poverty and environmental protection are not Therefore, their lives matter. And Amazonia is a very good example of a deep connection between deep poverty and environmental mm -hmm. protection and environment. Um, so yes, that's what I would, I would encourage students to see the link between poverty and environment in the exporting countries of natural, of natural products. Uh, I'm afraid our time is running out. So uh, yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Not at all. It was a great pleasure. <laughs>